We're going to try to be professional here and get everybody started on time. So welcome to Keller Williams. Thank you, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jim Liebens. I'm the uh, team leader here. If you're really impressed, my business card also says CEO, but I'm not sure what that means. So, um, so I just wanted to welcome you. Thank you. I wanted to just kind of uh, do some quick little housekeeping things for those of you that are here for the first time. If you've never been to a Keller Williams or if you're not part of us, what uh, we're committed to training. And my goal as the team leader at this market center is to make us the number one training facility south metro or south of the river. Because if you live out this way, you never want to go across that river, do we? Right? So if you're working this area, so we're dedicated to bringing free CE credits to you. If you're not on our mailing list, please, we'll get on the mailing list. We're going to be doing a lot more commercial stuff over the next year. And this is why. We believe that better training means better agents. Better agents mean better transactions. And better transactions means more what? And I think everybody wants to make more money. So uh, I, I believe the foundation to that is training, coaching, teaching, and that's what we're trying to deliver here. So um, I just want to welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. And let us know afterwards your feedback. And if this was beneficial, please fill out the cards. That's what kind of gauges who we bring in and out of here. So thank you for that. And who set this up? Becky and Paula. Paula, Paula thank you for setting this up. Appreciate it. Um, did you want us to pass the basket for you? <laughs> uh, a couple other quick things, and then I'll get out of your hair. Some uh, housekeeping things. Bathrooms. Go back down the hallway and go out the door and take a left. If you need to take a phone call, your professional salespeople, take your phone calls. If you need a private office, any office that's open, but you can go right in the back here. There's an open office right behind this wall. Just feel free. Or you can go into Tom's office. Tom is in the back. He's got a real nice yep. office. Uh, feel free to go in there and take your calls. Feel free to use the resource center. Uh, if you need to get online, there's no password required for it. Just jump out there and take care of your business. Uh, what else? Lunch. We thought we'd pass the hat for lunch. Is anybody opposed to passing the hat? So this is just think of this as a hat. So we'll pass the basket. Throw a couple bucks in there. We'll order some pizza. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're planning on ordering pizza for lunch. So I'd like to take a head count to know it's going to be five bucks a head. Okay. Um, how many of you guys want to participate? <laughs> so, throw 10 bucks in there. We'll do it. We'll collect at lunch. Okay. Uh, what else? Cooler water back here. Yeah. Help yourself to coffee. It's in the it's in the uh, kitchen right over here. Help yourself. I think there's some water and sodas in the refrigerator. Feel free to help yourself on that. And otherwise, uh, that's all I had. So thank you everybody for being here. Paul. Oh. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Paula Port. I'm one of the commercial brokers in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I want to uh, thank the speakers today. This is the Self-Directed IRAs and Real Estate Investment Program. And I want to especially thank Jeff O'Brien for coming up with the topic, uh, which is very current. We have three speakers today. I'm going to talk about them a little bit. Todd Gill is the owner and president of Nexus Direct IRA LLC, which is a self-directed IRA 401k administrator. They specialize in the facilitation of alternative investments, such as real estate, inside of these retirement plans. Todd has extensive expertise in this area, and he's a long-time real estate investor. Uh, for information afterwards, we can give you more, uh, give you his phone number and email for anyone who wants to contact him. And we also have Josh Manier. He currently serves as the president of Island View Mortgage. This company was originally founded by CPA and financial planner. Island View specializes in non-recourse financing and investment alternatives for high net worth individuals who utilize self-directed retirement accounts. He also works as a strategic advisor on a select number of private equity transactions with clients throughout the country. He has a BA in business finance from Bethel University and currently maintains a limited broker's license, mortgage loan originator's license, and has managed numerous real estate investment projects throughout the Twin Cities metro. 
for the past few years. He's been an instructor at Kaplan, and everybody knows Kaplan, teaching mortgage finance and real estate education. And then Jeffrey O'Brien is an attorney with the Loman Abdo Law Firm, which is in Minneapolis and Hudson, Wisconsin. He practices in the areas of business and real estate law. Jeffrey has significant experience in business formation matters, including several LLCs funded through self-directed IRAs. Licenses both Minnesota and Wisconsin. Jeffrey is a Minnesota State Bar Association board certified real property specialist. He's also, I don't know if any of you listen to the real estate radio hour, he's the voice of the legal minute on the, that uh, radio hour, which is held every Saturday on WCCO 8.30 a.m the Real Estate Radio Hour. He has been named a Minnesota Super Lawyers Rising Star every year since 2008. And for information on their websites and phone numbers, we can provide later. So, thanks, and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Toskin for a second. Okay. Thanks for coming. Back. Good. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you very much for your attendance here today. Um, uh, on my bio, one thing I normally don't tell people unless it's in a group like this, I was a REMAX agent for 25 years. I got my real estate license in 1976, uh, when if you could fog a mirror, you could sell a piece of real estate. Thank goodness, because I was 22 years old and didn't have a clue. Uh, so I was very fortunate to get into real estate uh, at a very young age. Um, and uh, also, uh, only got three courses of my CCIM designation done. I didn't follow up and continue in that, even though I was doing some commercial real estate. Uh, part owner in a mortgage company and a title company. So I've been uh, past president of the Minnesota Association and the Minneapolis Association. My claim to fame on the commercial division is Sherman Melkerson. I don't know if any of you know who that is. Sherman Melkerson, good for you that you're shaking your head because he's a very uh, great man. And I put together the MinCar Association. He and I were the ones that were instrumental in that because I was getting into commercial and Sherman Melkerson was in commercial. So we, we melded the two associations and, and uh, so that's my only claim to fame in the commercial industry. Uh, just, just some background. Uh, doesn't matter, I've been doing this now for 10 years. Uh, the owner of this company, uh, self-directed. I'm actually here for one purpose, and one purpose only, and that is to help you make money. Uh, I will guarantee you that you will not successfully retire based on your commissions. I have some of the top <coughs> residential realtors as my clients, some of the top commercial realtors in the state of Minnesota as my clients. I know what they have in their retirement account. And if you think that you are going to retire based on your commissions, you better think again. Very few of you will retire because you make so much money in commissions. Not going to happen unless you start investing for yourself. Uh, so, I'm pretty blunt, but I'm very transparent. So, how many of you are commercial realtors? Just so I can get, okay, the majority of you, and the rest of you are residential? Yes, okay, so, uh, here's what I wanna focus on. I just want to be able to uh, help you get your arms around this strategy. It can be very simple, it can be complicated, but it can be all. It can be very simple, just to help you understand how do you take advantage of your retirement plan to use it to your benefit, help seek other people who have retirement plans, so that, uh, you can help them make money also. I'm just going to reference a couple uh, articles. Uh, my wife doesn't think I read anything. I, I subscribe to ten different magazines. Uh, I'm, I get the, the Bar Association magazine, I get Footnote, CPA magazine, I get FBA Financial Planning magazine, I get the Commercial magazine, I get the Residential magazine, I read Forbes, I read Inc., I read Entrepreneurial, I read Business Week, I read about uh, eight to ten different magazines a month. Now why would I do that? Because I have no life? No, it's because I want to learn. I want to know everything I possibly can about different industries so I can use it to my advantage as an investor. Here was the Forbes magazine from April. In this Forbes magazine from April, it's talking about investing in taxes. And it has a picture of two gentlemen in here. Well, the first gentleman, his name is Max uh, Levchin, and he is the co-founder of PayPal. And he also started Yelp. 
The other person in here is Dustin Moscovich. He is the co-founder of Facebook. Now, why are they in this article? The reason they're in this article, and it has to do with taxes, is because the majority of the shares that they own in these two companies are in their self-directed Roth IRAs. Now, these two gentlemen obviously have to be pretty smart, correct? I will guarantee you, I will bet all the money that I have that neither of these two young men, as smart as they were, knew about self-directed IRAs. Not going to happen. Now, who told them about that? It probably was their CPA, their tax attorney, possibly their financial planner, but I doubt it. Why wouldn't it have been the financial planner? Because the financial planner doesn't make any money on self-directed IRAs. So, as smart as these two men are, I know they didn't know about self-directed IRAs. One of their circles of trusted advisors told them about it. And now they've got the majority of all of their income and shares in these two companies are in a Roth IRA, which means that all the gain inside the Roth IRA is tax-free. They took their Roth IRAs and invested into these two startup <coughs> companies, which is perfectly legal. Oh, unbelievable. It doesn't get any better than tax-free. This is the, the recent uh, uh, Forbes magazine, June. The article's on Mitt Romney. What is he worth? Anybody have an idea of how much Mitt Romney's worth? It's $230 million. Now, why would I bring this article? Because Mitt Romney uh, has, these rich people, they don't invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. No, rich people don't do that. Rich people invest in real estate. Rich people have 80 million in alternative investments, oil and gas, foreign currency, individual equities, and private companies. He has $260,000 in gold, interesting enough. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett does not own gold. What does Warren Buffett invest in? Does anybody know? Other than trains and stuff like that. He's a big silver guy. Warren Buffett says you invest in gold only as a hedge against inflation. He does not believe in that. He invests in silver, owns lots of silver mines. People don't even know that. Now, uh, according to this, Mitt Romney doesn't own any silver. He just owns a bunch of gold. So, but the reason I mention this is because of alternative investments. You will not successfully retire. I don't care who you are without some forms of alternative investments inside your retirement plans. And I'm not talking stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. I do not own a single stock, a single mutual fund, or a single bond. I haven't since 1997. I diversified out of all stocks, bonds, and mutual funds in 97. Now, the mo majority of you, I'm sure, are thinking that's pretty stupid. What do I invest in? I invest in what I know and understand, what I've been trained on, what I train myself on. So the majority of my holdings happen to be in real estate investments. That's what I have my edge in. And now I've been, I've, after the, the last 10 years, learned about different alternative investments. Now I've invested in private startup companies. I've invested in, I, I buy silver, I don't buy gold myself. Uh, precious metals, different things, alternative investments that I've trained myself on, learned about because I'm a control freak. I don't like anybody touching my money or making any decisions on my money other than me. I'm either going to make a shitload of money or I'm going to lose it, but it's going to be my fault or my gain. Okay, so, and I have, I don't, I've only had two cups of coffee. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, here's, here's what I want to help you with. You have probably, if you're self-employed, you have a SEP IRA or a traditional IRA. Uh, and any of those can be self-directed if you want to uh, uh, put them in, in alternative investments. Uh, the problem with self-directing is the fact that you're basically on your own. That is the biggest problem that I, uh, that I see is there's a, there's a pretty big learning curve. Uh, we're an administrator. 
That's all we are. We administrate and facilitate your investment, your choice of investment, based on the due diligence that you've done uh, on your investment. And as long as it's a legal investment and you've got the money, we'll fund it. You could buy the table that you are leaning on right, you could buy the chair that you're sitting on in your IRA. That's a legal investment, if you thought it was a good investment. I bought furniture in my IRA, leased it out to a mortgage company. I was making lots of money on it until the mortgage company went out of business. I was making lots of money on that furniture. It was an investment inside my IRA. So there's, this is such a creative strategy. Uh, I used to do 1031 exchanges for my property. I always got nailed on the 1031 because every time I, I could never, that I, that all the properties I wanted to identify, somebody else wanted. I mean, if you buy a piece of property in your IRA, you could buy it today, close it this Friday, turn around, sell it next week, and don't have to do a 1031 exchange. I don't do 1031 exchanges anymore. Don't need to. My investment property outside of my private investment property is all in my IRA. back on track, sorry. Um, uh, also, I, I really love questions too. So if you're brave enough to ask questions, I like that too. And you probably have a, have a time frame for that. So here's how this works. It's pretty darn simple. You open a Roth IRA with us, a traditional IRA with us. If you're self-employed, you should get rid of your SEP IRA and open a 401k plan, a Roth 401k <coughs> plan. Every person who's self-employed should get rid of their SEP IRA. That's the, the old one was the KEO, and then the SEP IRA took over uh, in 1978, 1980 uh, for the self-employed. I had a SEP IRA. I no longer have a SEP. Uh, and now the, the Roth 401k plan has taken over, and that is bar none the best type of retirement plan for anyone who's self-employed because you can put more money into it you can add the Roth component to it, add money to the Roth side. Yes, you're paying tax on that. You're also adding money to the traditional side, and you're building two buckets, and it can be self-directed. And money from a SEP IRA or a traditional IRA can transfer right into that. No, no harm, no foul, no tax. So, uh, so that would be something that you'd probably want to look at. Uh, uh, and even if you didn't want to self-direct you should be looking at opening a, a Roth 401k plan <coughs> with your financial planner or somebody else too. I mean, it, it is the best thing for you to possibly do because you could fund it uh, with more money. And with the real estate market now uh, getting to be uh, a little better, uh, you'll be making more money and you'll want to start funding these retirement plans. Um, uh, part of the problem with retirement plans is you can't take advantage of them until, what, 59 and a half. So, uh, that's part of the issue with younger people is because they have such a short attention span and they uh, want to have uh, instant gratification. They go, why would I contribute money to a retirement plan when I've got to wait 40 or 50 years to take advantage of it? I get that. But these young people, if they were contributing to a Roth IRA, boy, I'm all over the board. If they were contributing to a Roth IRA, they could use uh, some of that money uh, uh, for a down payment on a house. First $10,000 out of a Roth is tax-free. You could use that for your first house. You could pay for all your college education out of a Roth IRA. All three of my boys, 28, 25, and 21, all have Roth IRAs. They all have self-directed Roth IRAs with me. Guess what? I don't help them one bit. Now, why would a dad not help their kids? How in the hell are they going to learn if I help them? No. Everybody learns differently. So, my oldest son, Kyle, who's very smart, thinks he's too smart. That's part of the problem. And that's an international stocks. Makes a lot of money. Then what does he do? Gets greedy and stupid. Then he loses all his money. My middle son, Kelly, uh, who's a musician, doesn't have a clue about this stuff. Doesn't have a clue. So what does that tell me as a dad? I've got to have his back the rest of his life because he doesn't have a clue. 
He's sitting in cash because he doesn't have a clue. He doesn't want to even want to learn this stuff. My youngest son, Connor, uh, works two jobs to fund his Roth IRA. Yeah. That's my relationship with my son. My wife thinks I'm kind of cracked, but no, I think it's a good relationship. I told him you'll have more money than any of your friends because it's all in a Roth IRA. Um, he's just accumulating money, so he hasn't done very well yet, uh, but it is interesting. Anyways, so here is the, uh, 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 here is the order of the best retirement plans, in my opinion. For anyone who's self-employed, it's the Roth 401k plan. That is the best plan bar none. After that comes the Roth IRA. Okay, now let me get to you, I'll get to your question. After that comes the SEP, SEP. Um, if you're a small business owner, you might open a simple plan, and after that is these traditional IRAs. Why do I not like these traditional IRAs? Now that I know what I'm doing, and I'm an expert in this field, I don't like these traditional IRAs. My game plan is to be in the highest tax bracket when I retire. And if my money is in a traditional IRA, what does that mean? That means that the IRS is giggling and laughing because they're going to tax the hell out of that traditional IRA. 90% of everybody in the United States has a traditional IRA. About 7% have a Roth. And do you know who I blame? I don't blame you. I blame your CPA and your financial planner for giving you wrong advice. One, the financial planning industry doesn't understand this stuff. They should. Number two, what's the problem with CPAs? They're tax adverse. There's good tax and bad tax. Roth is good tax. So, let me go to your question. Why well, can you get me back on track? How do you get around the limitation for Roth? Limitation in yes, you're talking the amount about of the, money? You're talking about the income uh, limitations on a Roth IRA. Yes. Uh, here's on the Roth IRA. Uh, to make a contribution to a Roth, <coughs> you have to, as a single person, you have to make under $114,000 adjusted gross income. As a married couple, $176,000 to make a $5,000 contribution to a Roth. Here's the problem with these Roth IRAs. The contribution's $5,000. How stupid is the IRS and Congress? They're the ones that set these laws. If they really cared about your retirement plan, the Roth contribution should be $20,000, $30,000 a year, not five. Who do they support? They support all of these companies' 401k plans. You know who's making money on these company 401k plans? The administrators. They're bailing money on these fees. If I was a litigation attorney, I'd be suing every one of these 401k plan administrators, and I'd be cleaning up. They charge too much money, and they're in crap investments, and they're locked up. That's the problem with company 401k plans. Now, back to your question. So that's for contributing to a Roth IRA. But you can convert a traditional IRA into a Roth. Let's say you had $100,000 in your set, and you wanted to convert that to a Roth. Well, that's a pretty big tax bill because it's $100,000 worth of income. But let's say you had a lot of carryover, depreciation, and other things from the following year, which dwindles your income down. That might be a great year to convert that money to a Roth. Uh, and that's available right now for anybody. Another strategy is if your income is too high and your CPA tells you you can't make a contribution to a Roth, here's the tip. Make a contribution to a traditional IRA. Don't take it as a tax deduction. You make a non-deductible contribution to a traditional IRA of five grand. And because you took no deduction on that, you open a Roth and make a transfer tax-free into the Roth of five grand. You could be making a million dollars a year and you can use that strategy. If you can find a financial planner that knows that rule, you better grab onto them. Because they don't. I go, what the hell have they been trained on? Product. That's the problem. And I don't mean to beat up on financial planners because we work with a lot of financial planners. 
but they're all independent financial planners, fee-based, because they're client-centric, not product-driven. But that's what you'll, you really want to look into that. Uh, the best advice I can give any of you is to do whatever you possibly can, either have a Roth IRA or make a conversion to a Roth IRA. These tax brackets are already graduated and basically <coughs> set in stone for the next eight to 10 years. They're already done. Then Congress and the IRS just tweaks them each year. Yeah, I see we've got a problem. I'm 58. Yeah, I think anybody in their 50s and 55 and older, they've got an issue because the tax brackets are going up. Okay, that's enough of that. We need to talk about real estate. That's the fun part. So, yes. So what's the advantage of the Roth 401k versus the Roth IRA? Well, if you're self-employed, all you really need is a Roth 401k plan. But here's the beauty of the, uh, having both. You can make five, I'm over age 50, so I could make a contribution to the Roth of six grand. I can make a contribution to the Roth side of the 401k plan of 22,000. And I can make an additional $34,000 contribution to the traditional side. That's why you want both. And just follow this logic. And this is how simple this is for the CPAs. You've got a Roth 401k plan and you're self-employed. And you've got $10,000 this year that you can make as a contribution. Just follow this. This is how simple this is. You're going to put $5,000 into the Roth side. Whenever you put money into, the Roth, into a Roth, what is it? It's income to you and you have to pay tax on it, correct? Right. So you're going to pay tax on five grand, right? Then you make a contribution to the traditional side of the 401k plan. And when you make a contribution to the traditional, to a traditional IRA, what do you get? A $5,000 deduction, right? So what have you done with that contribution? Oh, washed out the tax. Isn't it that simple? If your CPA does not understand that, fire them and get a new one. It is that simple. Everybody complicates this stuff. No, it's all math. Understanding some of these rules. I'm the only speaker you'll ever hear this from. I love the IRS. I am so fascinated by their rules. I read tax code. My wife thinks I flipped out. I also despise the IRS because a lot of these rules are very nebulous and they and they don't. Uh, they're chickens and they're afraid to give you information and uh, define what they're talking about. So let me give you an uh, example. I'm getting into Jeff's area. Oh, yeah. Okay, you're going to Yeah, one question. Doesn't the amount of your income limit how much you can put into the traditional IRA? Uh, you're over, no. over 162,000 married. No, Here, here's the question. Here's Not non-deductible, deductible. Yeah, deductible, yes. Deductible, deductible yes. Okay. So the question he's asking is, does your income uh, the higher income, does it preclude you from uh, uh, putting money into a deduct uh, deductible IRA? Yes, it does. Right. So if you're making so much money and you can only contribute $3,000 to a traditional, fund oh, the rest in a, in a non. That's how you beat the system. Say that again? You fund, you fund whatever you possibly can in a tr traditional and take a deduction, right. and the rest of the contributions you put in a non-deductible IRA. If you're over a certain amount, you can't put anything in there. No, that's wrong. Why? You can always fund a non-deductible IRA. No, no, I didn't say non-deductible. No, no, that I is correct. Traditional. That is true. Yes, you can. But then why in the heck would you have a traditional IRA if you're self-employed? No, I agree. I'm just talking yeah. about the fact that what the tax laws are right now. That's right. Okay. That's all. That's, Th all. that's the okay. problem. All right. Absolutely correct. Okay. And they haven't kept up with... with right. The, I absolutely. agree. Yeah. In fact, you're right. Yeah. I don't mean to be argumentative. But I'm but not yes, arguing with you one oh, No, I like... I have to do that. taxes in season, so... I, I like... Oh, that's... I like you're a, you're like a violent agreement. Very good. Yes, yes. So it's understanding uh, some of these rules to your advantage. Uh, just uh, in the tax code, in one place it says uh, you can't be the manager of your LLC. About four pages later it says you can be the manager, you just can't get paid. Right. Well, isn't there a discrepancy in the code? Absolutely. That's why you have to go to an attorney. 
I don't tell you one way or the other. Do I have an opinion? Absolutely I do. Do I do it a certain way? Absolutely I do. But that's not my right. I'm your administrator. I'm not your attorney or CPA or financial planner. That's why you have to go to an attorney. That's why you have to use a CPA. If you're going to use some of these strategies, you're crazy if you don't. Even though I consider myself to be a fairly sophisticated investor, whenever I'm on, on the hunt for an investment, I get blinders on. I can't think, huh, yeah, I can't even think straight. I want that investment so bad. So I have to be calling my attorney. I have to be calling, you know, I call Jeff. I have to be calling my CPA say, and ask them, am I stupid or what? Please tell me. Because I get blinders on. Because I want the deal so bad. That's, that's just me. So getting the circle of trusted advisors, I would just encourage you, if at all possible, to get that. And while I'm thinking about it, a relationship with a private banker, a relationship with somebody like Josh that understand is the most critical relationship you can have in today's marketplace is the relationship to get financing, without a doubt. Because we're in this, unfortunately, for quite a while. So let's go back to real estate. Um, who wants to give me an example that I can structure for you? How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. Who wants to give me a, a transaction? Five minutes. Maybe five more minutes. Okay. Real quickly, anybody want to give me a transaction? You're just thinking about it, uh, what to buy, or how we, how will you do this? And I'll just structure it for you real quickly. Apartment building. Apartment building. Sure. Uh, uh, we have. A lot of our commercial uh, uh, realtor clients are investing in apartment buildings, uh, typically through Timberland down in Bloomington. Uh, and they're either uh, doing it several different ways. They're either investing in Timberland's REIT, which I don't believe in, that's just me. I, I don't like REITs, that's just me. Not saying they're bad. Uh, or they're, they're funding uh, that company's uh, pool, and then they invest in uh, into apartments, or they're actually having ownership interest directly into apartment building uh, in, in an entity, typically an LLC, where there's multiple investors. Uh, so uh, that's what can be done. Or uh, if they have enough of the money inside their retirement plan, um, they're buying a fourplex, sixplex, whatever it might be. Uh, and then they're uh, getting non-recourse financing for the difference. Uh, real estate is one of the only investments that the IRS will allow you to leverage. That's pretty cool. Uh, Josh is going to talk about these non-recourse loans, uh, which are, I think it's the way to go. Uh, I know not everybody's got uh, tolerance for leverage, but uh, 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 it's something that you should really look at. So, um, but any, any form of real estate is a legal investment inside your retirement plan other than your primary home, your second home, or any investment you currently own. So for you to create wealth, you need to invest in yourself, buy some things inside your retirement plan, seek out people who have retirement money, and then sell them something so you get a commission. They're a happy camper because they've invested. Or seek out people who have uh, money in their retirement plan that don't know what to do with it. And then they can make a loan out of their IRA to you. And you could use that money, which then becomes private money, to invest in real estate. So there's many different avenues of being able to do this. Um, and we're happy to be a resource for you. And uh, if you're interested, we've got some brochures, my card, and I've got a CD that I did. did it's an hour and five minutes long on questions and answer. I don't hand the stuff out because I'm not here to pitch. I don't like pitching. So even though you think this is a pitch. Uh, so if you want it, you can take it. If you don't, no problem. Uh, so, but happy, we're going to stick around and happy to answer any questions you might have. And maybe I'll jump in when uh, the other two gentlemen are yeah. on their deal. You Thank bet. you. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Well, uh, for those of you who may not know, I'm uh, Josh Manier. Yeah, and I've worked with uh, Todd Grill and Jeff O'Brien for the last couple of years doing self-directed retirement accounts. Uh, a little over two years ago, had started out uh, working with individuals and learning about self-directed retirement accounts, specifically in the background of real estate. Uh, 
A little bit of statistics in terms of the industry of self-directed IRAs. There's approximately 900,000 self-directed IRA account holders as of about a year ago. And it's an emerging market, so thousands of self-directed IRA holders are rolling over dollars from traditional IRAs into self-directed account administrators such as uh, uh, Nexus and Todd's company. And then from there, allocating to real estate or other investments. Uh, real estate, based upon my own uh, industry research, accounts for over half of all the investment alternatives. So of the 900,000 uh, accounts that are self-directed currently in the country, over half of them, in some form or fashion, are investing in real estate. Now, it could be the REITs, it could be private loans, it could just be equity, but in some form or fashion, the majority of these alternative asset classes are focused in real estate. So in terms of the context of what we're talking about here today, most self-directed IRA holders have the highest level of comfort as well as experience with some form or fashion of investing in real estate. So being able to bring this up as an alternative is a real great uh, way to give value-added information where, as Todd said, maybe they don't know what they want to do with the retirement account, but they want to be able to invest it. Uh, my portion that I cover and the company that I operate, we basically coordinate non-recourse loans uh, pretty much throughout the country. And we've got a variety of different programs. Anyone know what a non-recourse loan is? Anyone know? What, what's a non-recourse loan? You don't have an obligation. If something happens along the way, they can't come up to your personal assets. They come up, they only can get what they can get. That's they right. They can't attack you. They can't attack, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent answer. They cannot, they cannot attach any other asset or any other personal guarantee. So no personal guarantee is allowed. So when you're talking with your uh, investors, you have someone that has a, an account, and they say, I want to invest in real estate, and they give Todd a call, we coordinate with Jeff to get the entity set up and roll over that account. Okay, they walk through that process. They've got the paperwork set up, boom. They got $200,000 sitting in an account, and they're ready to pull the trigger on real estate. Now the next question is, should they have leverage? or should they not, okay? That comes down to both an economic issue, okay, is there cash flow to support the repayment of the loan? And it also comes down to comfort level, right? Do they have a comfort level with, you know, their, their level of sophistication as an investor, do they have a comfort level with having leverage or not on the property? As you mentioned on the non-recourse loan, do you think lenders are willing to give non-recourse loans or not willing to give non-recourse loans in general? Well, the banks are giving it. Why are they not willing? There's no, what's wrong with no guarantee? Risk. Who do they go against? Who do they go against? So, how many of you like to shop around for lenders to get interest rates, right? Why, why do you do that? Get the best terms. Get the best terms, right? Get the best rate, cost for your clients. With non-recourse financing, there's only a couple of lenders nationwide that are offering it. And so, I, I welcome you to check with other banks or other things like that, but uh, my company, uh, via my assistant, uh, has called hundreds if not thousands of banks checking to see if they'll offer this. And we got like a dozen responses out of maybe 5,000 banks. And when we followed up with those banks on actual loan requests, do you want to know if they went through or not? No. The person at the low end of the total pool of the banking said, oh, we can do it. And so we get all the documents and we put it forward and they said, no, we're not going to do it. So from a little bit of background of what my company has done, We've already sort of paved the way a little bit in terms of the non-recourse financing. If you're able to find a banker that will do that, by all means, go ahead and use them. I just want to save everyone a little bit of hassle and say it's not readily available. Okay, I met with a uh, community banker that I actually do banking with on the business side yesterday for an hour for lunch. Gave him all the information. I said, you guys can set whatever rules you want for the non-recourse. Does that sound pretty fair? If you're a bank, you're sitting on a lot of money? Yeah let's loan at 30% loan to value or 40% loan to value. He said, you guys give me the rules, give me the rates. I'm doing a, a national marketing campaign for this type of financing. I said, I have 40 people right now I could call. Uh, 40 people have contacted me within the last year looking for this financing. I can send you at least half a dozen deals within the next few months. I got an email this morning, what do you think he said? He presented it to his committee of lenders. What do you think he said? It's a great idea, but <clears throat> what, what was their hang up? Guaranteed. Right. Personal guarantee. Right. Here's, here's the deal with the non-recourse piece. As you said, they can't personally sign for it. Anyone know why? 
is it the bank's rule? This is important to know, and, and Jeff and Todd will touch on it. If you have a self-directed IRA holder, they purchase a piece of real estate, and they personally guarantee it, their entire retirement account could be subject to early withdrawal, the 10% penalty in tax, and additional penalties for, for violating that. And depending on how much time has elapsed, could be additional penalties. So they could basically implode their retirement account and have huge ta tax consequences, probably have to sell the property unless they have other liquidity in different accounts. So the fact that it's not recourse is like a non-negotiable. Um, now, what are some of the benefits to the IRA holder that it's not recourse? Less risk. Less risk, why is that? Well, the IRA, IRA, IRA holder is, yep. the deal goes bad, you only lose what's in the middle. You only lose what you put up. So from a lending standpoint, I do uh, underwriting for some private mortgages that I uh, work with and some investors. We're requiring a minimum of 40% cash down from the IRA holder to try to mitigate that risk. Plus, we're making sure that the property cash flows, we're getting full appraisals, we're doing comparable rent schedules on our appraisals to make sure that the market rent actually equals what the lease is. Because maybe they're leasing the, uh, let's say it's a condo unit, maybe they're leasing that condo unit that's owned by someone's self-directed retirement account, and they're leasing that to a buddy of theirs. And the buddy's renting it for 2,000 a month. They, do, they come and do a non-recourse loan with me. The appraiser says, hey, this, is, this unit's only worth $1,200 a month. Which figure as an underwriter and as a lender am I gonna use? I'm gonna use the 1,200, okay? If, if, for the program that I underwrite for, if the IRA holder has to subsidize the expenses, you think I'm doing the loan? No, I'm not doing the loan. Because what if they run out of money, right? If they run out of money, do I wanna own the property as a lender? Think the lender does? No. Probably not. So that's sort of the benefit to the IRA holder. They can't go after any other assets within the IRA or personally. Uh, but there's limitations, okay? There's limitations on financing. There's a couple banks nationally that are doing it that uh, we work with and we know what their rules are and their guidelines, what they will and won't take. And we have to coordinate those files. There's also a couple regional banks uh, in, uh, there's one in Washington State and there's one in Colorado that we also work with as well. So we have a pretty good lay of the land as far as what the non-recourse loans are and then implications for a lender, okay? Once that down payment is given, the loan is underwritten, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Either they're gonna repay that loan and the lender will be repaid, or if they don't repay it, if the lender somehow put too much leverage on the property, and let's say the property value went down, who's taking the loss? Lender. Lenders taking the loss. Is there anything they can do to recoup that loss? No. No. That's why not recourse financing is is hard to come by if you're talking with a community bank or someone else. Now there are exceptions when you talk about larger commercial properties. Let's say a million dollars and up for you know a loan amount, things like that. Uh, multifamily or office buildings. You get into sort of some commercial mortgage-backed securities. Then they're more willing to do a non recourse uh, type piece. Uh, but for most transactions that you and I will do on a daily basis, uh, there's, there's just not a lot of options. So we can go to the next one. There. So who's making the non-recourse loans? It's probably a good thing to know, right? If you're going to tell a client, hey, you should, you should roll over and, and get a self-directed account and set this up. And let's say they want to use financing. There's some national <coughs> banks, private mortgage company, uh, which I am, and then conduit lenders, which uh, generally are life insurance companies, uh, other institutional investors. And uh, we work with all, we do our own loans uh, portfolio, and then we work with conduit lenders and national banks. We actually understand the structure of the self-directed and how to be able to tailor the documents and the underwriter requirements to meet the guidelines of these different institutions. Okay, you might call a bank and they say, no, we can't do the deal, but you call our office and you give us the specs on the financials, and we can perhaps, depending upon the financial structure away, be able to make the deal happen because we understand the guidelines of what the banks will and will not take. Okay, so we are a little bit, you know, a, a more of an advisory type role of how to structure a non recourse transaction. Uh, for conduit lenders, probably the most popular request that we get at our company is for multifamily. Has anyone heard of multifamily sort of heating up a little bit? With, uh, rents on the rise, vacancies down. Uh, the lowest loan amount that we have for a conduit is currently 750000 
um, but we can go up to 75% loan to value. Any loan amounts below a million, generally 60% loan to value is sort of the maximum. Okay, so if you get up in the higher dollar range, usually you can get a little bit more uh, in terms of leverage. So, we can go to the next one. So, how many people in here are trying to pre-qualify clients? Is that a good idea? Why is that? Waste your time. Waste your time. What if the loan doesn't work? I hear some uh, giggles, I see some smiles, right? That's not a good scenario. Because what's if the financing doesn't work, what does that mean to you as an agent? Yeah. Even if you can salvage the deal, your borrower has to go to another lender and do what? Go through the whole process again. So do you have to coordinate stuff with the other lender? So is now that sort of drags out when you get paid, drags out your workload, okay? So I put this up here, and for some of you may say, well, this is, you know, I'm not a finance person. I don't need all this technical stuff. I can, I'd be glad to send any of you that want uh, this information. It's also found on our company's website. But if you can help your borrowers by just giving them these or helping them to pre-qualify based upon these requirements, you'll be like three or four steps ahead of anyone that contacts our office. Because most of the folks that contact our office, they're asking for this information, okay? And so, one to four family investment properties, depending upon the property type, normally condos are limited to like 50%, loan to value, because they're a little, a little more risky as a property type, it's more like 50%. Uh, up to 65%. Normally, uh, single family homes sometimes can do up to 65% uh, loan to value. Any two to four unit properties are generally limited at 60%. Uh, the reserves, 15 to 20% of the loan amount in reserves. What do you think we have that? What do you think that's, that's necessary? It's not a recourse, right? If I'm a lender, do I want the, do I want the IRA to run out of money? No. What if they run out of money and let's say the borrower can't put another 5000 in for the year and they're out of money and let's say the renter bailed and they destroyed the property? Okay? So the requirement for the reserves is based upon the loan amount and then does anyone know how to calculate a debt service coverage? Okay? Those of you that are commercial brokers I'm sure do. You just take the total uh, expenses and you divide what the rental income is into the total expenses. So your PITI, uh, management fee, any other operating or ongoing expenses, you would net that out and you have to have at least 25% uh, income above whatever your expenses are per month. So how do, how do non-recourse lenders mitigate risk? A large down payment, make sure you have some cash reserves, a little powder in the keg, right? In case the tenant runs off or there's un unexpected repairs. Um, and then that the property itself cash flows. Uh, private mortgage companies, uh, like the company I own, we have a little more uh, looser requirements uh, in terms of reserves. We only require 10%, and we just have a 1% debt service. You have to break even with your expenses versus what the payment is. Um, we'll do blanket loans, so we'll do a non-recourse on multiple properties, okay, which other conventional lenders won't do. Also do renovation loans or construction loans. I've gotten numerous calls from clients. We've done a lot of loans where someone bought a property in their IRA and it wasn't finished. I got a call from a gentleman we did a loan for. He bought a condo that was stalled construction in his IRA for cash. Did you think he had enough money to finish the completion of the condo in his IRA? He did not, okay? He was not talking with Todd or Jeff to, to uh, proverbially slap him and say, why would you spend that much money and then not have enough money to finish the condo? Can you, can you rent out a condo that doesn't have drywall or flooring or appliances? But wait, you dropped a couple hundred thousand to do that, right? So that's the kind of, it sounds silly, but when Todd said one of the biggest hindrances is that people go it alone, some of the loans that I do here is more like cleanup stuff where it's like they didn't quite have enough or they didn't know what they were doing, they sort of stumbled into it. And so rather than the person just selling the condo non-completed and taking a $50,000 loss, whatever they take, they just contact us, we did a short-term loan, uh, and then they ended up refinancing. 
So uh, life components will do renovation loans, like like a uh, investment, you know, purchase and improvement, and then resell the property or new construction. And we'll all do these all on a non-recourse uh, basis. As of now, our company is the only one nationwide that's doing that. Uh, our, li our loan amount limits are 200,000 maximum for this program. Okay, so we're not doing the higher dollar commercial stuff because we're just working with uh, individual investors. And normally we're doing shorter term stuff, not more than maybe five or seven years uh, for that program. So go to the next one. Uh, lastly, we have conduit lenders. For those of you that are doing the larger, uh, more expensive commercial properties, normally up to 75%, could be 80% loan value uh, for multifamily on the non-recourse. This is for a fully stabilized cash flowing kind of deal, like the, the insurance company is giving the loan on the underlying asset. Like there's cash flow, there's stability and occupancy, they're just giving a lower rate note, and then the owner is putting the down payment and collecting the spread. Uh, so one and a quarter debt service, uh, fixed rate or fully amortizing products. If you have a investor, and I've told a few investors this the last probably year, the rates on this product are incredible. If you've got someone that's got three or 400,000 in a retirement account or more to allocate to multifamily, you can have them invested in their retirement account and in between like a four and a half to five and a half rate on a multifamily for like up to a 10 year fixed term. So other non-recourse loans generally are gonna range between, uh, depending on the program, you know, 6% to the private loans, you know, that are shorter term, you know, could be in the, uh, you know, mid uh, teens for interest rate. So, because they're, they're not readily available in the market. Okay, we can go to the next one. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something that our company has been involved with, and this is private real estate loans to or from IRA holders. So you may have an experienced real estate investor that wants to give a loan on behalf of their IRA. They don't want to own other property, they just want to give a loan secured by a mortgage. Here are the two options to do that. Once you set up the self-directed with uh, Todd and Jeff, you can use a facilitator like our company, which we tailor our loan programs to specified guidelines. Okay, and we do all the underwriting and the due diligence. Once it passes the scrutiny of being fully documented, then we have a list of investors that have expressed interest in funding these types of loans. And then we contact them. We take into account how long they want to hold the loan for. You know, some investors might say, I only want to do a 50% loan to value if I'm lending the money. So we do it based on their risk tolerance and investment time horizon criteria. If you're investing in the retirement account and you don't need the money for a long time, you might be okay making an 8% return on a private note over a five year term or a seven year term. Okay? If you're nearing the retirement age where you want to draw that out, then maybe you want a shorter term uh, type loan. Or you could locate the investment and fund the transaction yourself. Okay? So the biggest sort of downfall that you're on your own as a self-directed investor could be an asset if you have an investor that's sophisticated enough to be able to do that. So our company works facilitating private investors if they want to borrow the money or lend the money uh, based upon uh, our predetermined guidelines. Uh, some pitfalls to avoid. Yeah. On that type of thing, yes. that if you do that, yes. rates are above, well, above prime or for instance, what kind of rate would you be lending that out at? Would uh, someone want to do that with? Uh, it depends on the program. Okay, there's a, there's a couple different programs that we have. Uh, generally, it's an eight percent interest rate okay. that's paid out uh, to the investor, and then there's normally some sort of spread, you know, between three to five percent above that. That's the no rate to the borrower. Yeah. So that, and that's a great question. And two, we've had clients where, uh, let's say you have a, a borrower, uh, let's say you have a borrower that uh, has a self-directed and they want to purchase a property. Okay, they've got. 300,000 or 200,000 in the retirement account. They want to purchase a property for whatever reason. Let's say our company can't get them a non-recourse loan. They can't find a non-recourse loan elsewhere. Our company could serve, if, if you wanted to, our company could serve as an advisory to the seller to help underwrite the transaction and set up some sort of owner financing with non-recourse loan documentation so that it's IRS compliant. So you might have an investor that wants to invest with their self-directed, you have a seller over here that'd be willing to carry paper on a non-recourse basis. 
we could assist the seller in coordinating the underwriting to make sure that the cash flows, there's enough down, you know, what standard for non-recourse, make sure the seller understands that, and we could also coordinate uh, that transaction. Some pitfalls to avoid, led into disqualified persons or accounts. Um, any, anyone that is related to you, either parents, grandparents, uh, kids, or ears, are disqualified persons. So what someone can't do is say, take their self-directed account, <coughs> purchase a home, let's say in uh, Burnsville, and then let their adult kid live in the house, okay? Why can't you do that? Anyone know? The IRS says that you cannot gain a personal benefit from the investment purpose of the account. The, a good way to think about an IRA, anyone familiar with like a trust account? Or a trust? What is a trust? How does a trust work? Can you just do whatever you want with the trust? <coughs> if it's not a, um, uh, if it's just a trust, it's not irrevocable. Yeah, yep. I can do whatever I want with it. You do whatever you want. Yeah. Yep. If, if it's a trust that you can't change any of the terms of, you have to go within those guidelines, right? right? right. Or you've actually broken, you've yeah. broken the terms of the trust. Think about the IRA or the self-directed account as a trust. And the IRS is the one that writes all the <coughs> rules, right? And the IRS is writing the rules because if you violate the rules, then what do you, what happens? You gotta pay out, right? So as long as you're not lending or, or allowing a disqualified person to use the property, uh, and providing the non-recourse loans to ensure IRS compliance. Uh, we, our company uses uh, Jeff to draft all our non-recourse loan documents, because what I do not, what I will not have as, as the owner of Island View, is I will not have a borrower come to me and say, you gave, me a, you gave me a loan to my IRA that was supposed to be non-recourse, and it wasn't, okay? Jeff handles the paperwork on that because it's, if, it's, if somehow there's a personal guarantee in there, now all of a sudden we have actually assisted the borrower in imploding their retirement account, okay? So the fact that it's non-recourse is absolutely critical, and again, that's why uh, we use Jeff to draft all those documents to ensure that. So uh, that's all I had. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. Involving self-directed IRAs. Josh touched on one of them there with the prohibited with the disqualified persons. I'm going to just going to go a little, little bit more detail on that. Talk about prohibited transactions, um, and then we're going to get into a couple other issues here. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, we're going to talk about how we have checkbook control over the IRA through the use of an LLC. That's my big role in all this stuff. Is setting up the LLCs. We'll talk about the, the advantages of that, and we'll talk real briefly about some other legal risks that are out there involving. Um, involving the use of self-directed IRAs for uh, real estate investment. Um, the big thing you need to be aware of if you're gonna do this or if you're gonna advise uh, someone that you know that, that you're working with to do this is the self-dealing rules. And that's in the Internal Revenue Code section 4975. Um, it says that the, if an IRA owner can't use his or her IRA to engage in certain prohibited transactions without incurring the taxes, interests, and penalties that Josh was talking about a minute ago. Um, it's treated as an early withdrawal and you can get hit with well, all taxes and penalties, which is exactly the reason you're, what you're trying to avoid when you're setting up these kinds of accounts. Um, prohibited transaction is a transaction involving a disqualified person. Disqualified persons are what Josh mentioned, your spouse, your parents, grandparents, lineal descendants, children, you know, folks like that. That's who is considered a disqualified person. And if you're doing transactions like that, uh, within your IRA, you're going to have a problem. I had someone that I had to turn away one time because they were going to buy a piece of property within their IRA and rent it to their wife's business. Couldn't do that. that mm -hmm. It includes trusts and entities, trust for the benefit of disqualified persons as well as entities controlled by disqualified persons. They're all kind of one big umbrella. Um, and by the way, if anybody wants, I got cards up here. If you want to leave your cards, if you want these slides, because I have to go through kind of quickly because of the time involved. Um, I'm happy to do that. Some of this gets kind of small type, but you get to see some kind of the examples of prohibited transactions. <coughs> sale or exchange, leasing of any property between a plan and a disqualified person. The example I just said, lease the property to your wife's company for, you know, for use in their business, that's a problem. Um, transferring income of the assets to the plan to the, for the benefit of a disqualified person. 
Um, receipt of any consideration for a own personal account. This is one that gets into a problem with, you know, I've had the question before, well, how about if I buy a piece of property in my IRA and then I'll represent the buyer as, as an agent and sell it to them and then I can get a commission? No. You can't have personal benefit from of transactions involving your IRA. Um, this is just the text of the Internal Revenue Code section, but like we said, the, the main ones you have to remember, the lineal descendants, grandparents, parents, kids. Okay. There we go. Okay, so 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 you want to remember you want to remember when you're talking about the legal risks, you want to remember prohibited transaction and disqualified persons. And that's the first, and that's when you when someone comes to me and wants to do some kind of a deal involving their self-directed IRA, the first thing I ask, they'll come to me and say, I want to set up an LLC. Todd sent them over to me, or Josh sent them over to me. The first thing I say is, what are you planning to do? And we walk through, we break down the transaction to figure out what exactly they're proposing to do. And occasionally I gotta turn somebody away because I, I, I'm, I'm like peeling back the layers of the onion and I find a spot where it's rotten, right? Something didn't work, they're gonna violate the rules and I gotta tell them that, otherwise if I don't, then it's gonna be my head and my malpractice carrier later on when they get hit with it, you know, when the IRS comes calling, okay? So that's the first piece that I do before we even set up an entity for, for a client is to, is to dial back and figure out what exactly they're trying to accomplish. If that doesn't work, then, then, then they have to come up with some other way of doing it. Um, where my role comes in is, 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 you know, Todd sets up the account and what, where I come in is actually in setting up an LLC for the IRA owner. Now, a lot of you probably, if you're doing any kind of investment real estate already, you're probably already using LLCs, you know, as a, a liability limiting uh, measure. Um, they make, a single member LLC is a wonderful vehicle in this, in this kind of investing context because of course, for federal income tax purposes, it's disregarded. There is no separate tax return. They're very easy to administer. And in this case, it makes the administration of these, of the investments even, even easier because the IRA owner is able to write checks, able to sign purchase agreements, sign closing papers, rather than having to go back to Todd's office or whoever your administrator is to, to sign documents uh, for the transaction, okay? Um, the, um, the case, there was a case called Swanson versus Commissioner, it was a tax court case, and this was the case that's relied upon by, by those of us that are doing this for justification that you can start form a new entity, can, you know, issue ownership uh, units, membership interest to the IRA, even when the IRA owner is the president or chief manager of the LLC. Okay, um, I, it's, everybody asks me, do I have? Can I have somebody else? So and so said I, I need to have somebody else. If you can find your C, if you can have a CPA or some other independent person that you trust that you can that will, you trust enough to manage your your investments through your LLC I say go ahead and do it God bless you 99.9% .9 of my clients don't have that person they're representing themselves in this so they serve as the manager of the LLC and then to date I haven't had anybody that's had a problem with that and it's the Swanson case that's that's um, that's the justification for this so if someone's coming to me it's because they're, they want to they want to buy real estate within their IRA, and Todd's probably told them it's a lot easier for me and for you if you go call O'Brien and have him set you up with an LLC. We do it pretty quickly, pretty inexpensively, um, and get that going. One point of note, one caution thing: uh, I've had some people that want to come to me. They already have signed the purchase agreement. And they say I want to set up an LLC. Can't do it. You have to have the purchase the LLC set up, ready to go before you sign that purchase agreement. You can't sign it over, now you're, now you're, now you're doing self-dealing transactions because you now you're doing an assignment to your LLC. You uh, say, well, I'm just gonna close it and then I'll quit claim it over to my LLC. Even worse, you can't do that either. Um, the LLC has to be up, ready to go. So if, if you're gonna do this or if you have someone that you know is gonna do this, if they wanna use the LLC route, they wanna go the checkbook control route, they need to be in my office before they're gonna sign a purchase agreement or they're going to have they're going to have problems. Um, like I said, LLC is IRA or not, the LLC is the ideal liability limiting entity for real estate investment, especially with a single member because the single member, of course, is it's just disregarded. It's, you, you know, you, there's no separate tax return. There's no it's just everything goes on to your personal return. 
and this case the IRA, is you don't have that issue, so it's even easier. Um, the IRA owns the LLC, and the IRA owner serves as manager and governor of the LLC. Now, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong. One thing you have to do if you are the manager of the LLC, you know, you've got to get a statement at the end of every year as to the performance of your investment account right, with, with, with Todd's company. So as the manager, you've got to give him what you have to do. It's not a matter of him signing documents. You've got to give him the information as to what the, what, what's what's been purchased and sold through the IRA, what 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 action activity's been gone through the LLC that year, and what's left in the account. Because you set up a separate bank account, and the IRA investment goes over into the bank account. So that's one. And still, you have that continuing interaction. You do have some accountability back to your administrator to let them know what you've been doing with the L what, what's, as a manager of the LLC in terms of the funds, because he's got to give you a statement at the end of the year telling you what you know that, that you would use for your you know just like you get your fidelity statement or your Schwab or whatever other uh, other kind of uh, IRA or retirement account uh, statement that you get. So. What is it? What is it that I do if I'm setting up an LLC? Everybody's like, well, I could just go online on the Secretary of State and get that one-page form and file it, pay the filing fee, and it's done, right? No. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you come to me to do an LLC, um, we put together the Articles of Organization. It's a little bit more substantial than the than the Secretary of State form. They have this. The default is like what four questions. There's a few things in the LLC statutes beyond the scope of today's presentation that um, that. Uh, the default provisions in the LLC statute that we that we address in our articles that the Secretary of State's form does not take care of that. We give you bylaws, uh, contribution agreement, and that's a key piece here because there's some magic language that, that Todd's uh, company wants to see in that contribution agreement, and they actually sign it on behalf of your IRA account. You don't sign that. Typically, if, someone's, if you were coming to me and setting up just a regular old LLC, you would sign that as the owner and the manager. In this case, Nexus signs the the, um, the contribution agreement on behalf of the member, and then they do sign it as the, the chief manager. You have some written actions of the board of governors, and we get a separate tax ID number for the LLC. This is all creating a paper trail to show that this thing is separate from you, that it's funded correctly, that it's not it's not you using IRA funds for your personal use. This is an investment through your self-directed IRA. Um, the last point I want to touch on, and we'll take questions here at the end because I know I'm going through this very fast. Um, the, uh, there's some other risks, and this is one unrelated <coughs> business income tax. UBIT is income derived from sources unrelated to the primary function of the IRA account, that, and those things may be subject to tax, okay, but there are exceptions. And there, there are some instances where rental income may be subject to UBIT. Now, I'm not a tax advisor. My advice, and Todd touched on earlier, besides having me, if you're going to set up an LLC, is you want to talk with the tax advisor on this to make sure that whatever you're doing doesn't trigger a, a UBIT issue. Okay? There are exceptions. There are exceptions, and so and I, have, we have a, I have a lot of clients that are using this to, to own, you know, rental properties. You just have to be careful, and you have to have your team of advisors to give you to give you proper advice. So. Um, Oh, last thing I want to point out. Actually, no. That was it. So, um, I went through it really fast, but I want—I don't like—I don't like being denied lunch myself at presentations, and so I want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have. If you want copies of the slides, I'm happy to give them to you. Just give me your card, and I'll email them to you. Are there any questions about all that stuff that I just showed you? <coughs> Everybody absorbed it. It's just <laughs> perfect, right? You got it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to be right here year then. So the, the, the company that's within the IRA, you need to basically send the books or you're operating 